Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear um, the book of Revelation, I go, ooh, right? Um, because it's got a bit of a reputation, at least in my mind anyway. Um, it's the book that's a little bit weird. It's the book with all of the weird imagery um, that talks about the end of the world, um, and it can seem a bit confusing sometimes. So I thought I would start with a sort of summary, um, a bit about what Revelation is really about before we get started on this series. Um, it's not a fully comprehensive overview of all of Revelation, um, because I'm sure you'd all like to go home at some point this evening. Um, so as a short introduction to Revelation, um, this book, first of all, it's a letter. Um, a letter written by John whilst in exile on the island of Patmos. Um, and it's a letter containing the words of Jesus. It's a revelation he had where Jesus appeared to him and told him, write this down. Um, and he sent this as a circular letter um, to the seven largest churches of, uh, of Asia Minor at the time. And our first church this evening um, is the church of Ephesus. Now, the book does talk a bit about the end times, but it's not a book for us to be using to predict the future, particularly. It's not, that's not its main purpose. It does use lots of interesting language and lots of interesting imagery. But for the people at the time who the letter was directly written to, they would have understood a lot of that imagery. It would have made a lot of sense to them. It was uh, something from their past, from their culture, that they would have understood a bit more about. And for them, it would be all about making things make a bit more sense. Now, the point of Revelation, at least in the bits we're going to be looking at, seems to be to invite Christians to perceive the true character and realities of the things that they face every day. And to show them how they can respond to those things in a way that lets them live in the victory that Jesus won on the cross. Revelation was there to liberate these people from the powers and the rulers of the time. To show them what the Roman rule system was really like. To show them that the prosperity and wealth of the kingdoms of the Mediterranean wasn't all that it was about. And to show them that witnessing violence and calling that the rule of law was not what God had intended. For us, it's very much about us looking into our own society and about calling out society and the structures that we see around us, removing the veil that covers them to see what they truly are and how they truly affect our relationships with God. It asks a lot of very scary questions. Um, one in particular I will get onto um, later on tonight. Now, that's not what all of Revelation is about, but I think that's a, hopefully a relatively helpful point for us to start as we look at um, these letters. So this first one was written to the people and church of Ephesus, one of the major churches um, of the early Christian world, founded by Paul, um, when he went and he, uh, he spoke there um, and got them all going. Um, and you can read about that in Acts and in his uh, letters in the book of Ephesians, because Paul was in jail a lot. Um, a lot of his ministry to them was in the form of supportive letters um, and those that he sent to help them out. Um, and for the church, particularly the early church, they would have been operating in a culture that was completely different to a Christian culture. And their main guy, Paul, who had been there in the start, it had all been going really well, he had now got himself arrested and been asked to leave, um, and they were now trying to do it themselves. It must have been really difficult. It must have been a real struggle and a real challenge when all of the world around them was going, nah, this is how we live, and they're trying to say, this is how Jesus has shown us to live. We're going to live a different way. So, in the first part of this letter, they get some encouragement. That's what you really want, isn't it? You get a bit of encouragement in the first couple of verses. Um, must have felt really great. Because these are the words of Jesus. And he's saying, I see you. I have seen what you guys have been doing. And I was like, wow. That's, like, in my small little church, if we're talking about here, on the small little island of Jersey, do we, do we often think that God sees what we do? Because he does. I thought that would be a great encouragement. I've seen what you're doing. You're doing really well. This is really good. This is brilliant. Well done. Um, 
And don't Jesus can have real empathy with them when he, when he talks about their struggles that they've been going through? Because Jesus himself lived on earth. He suffered persecution. He went through these things. And he's standing beside them in this revelation saying, well done. I feel your pain. I've been there with you. But after these few verses, we get to the um, hard truth. That little bit that goes, but I have this against you. This one thing. It's the bit for you to work on. Now, at the moment, I'm working in a school. Um, I don't know about you, if you work in a school or if you remember your time at school, um, a lot of teachers' marking systems goes a bit like this. You get two stars and a wish. It's a really nice way of saying, this was good, this was good, do better at this. And this letter to me uh, appears to be a bit like that sort of system. He's going, you're doing this really well, you're doing this really well, this one. This is what you need to focus on. Um, so that's what we're going to jump into a bit more um, this evening, that thing that they can do a bit better at. Now, when I read through this letter, I could honestly see it very easily have been written to myself just over two years ago. Um, just over two years ago, I was working for another church, um, and I was the youth worker. I was planning different youth events, going around, um, doing one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, doing bits and bobs to keep the church running, um, things behind the scenes, uh, and all of that stuff. And it felt pretty good. I was doing a, doing a pretty good job, um, I thought, and uh, it's all going quite well. Um, but whilst I was doing all that, I, hadn't, I didn't really realise what was happening. Whilst I was doing all of that, I had started out of a place of, I was doing it because I loved God, and I loved his people, and I wanted to serve his people because I loved him. But over my time doing it, I forgot that. Over that time, I started treating my faith as, as my job. I didn't do it anymore because I loved God. It wasn't the reason I was doing it anymore by the end. It was because it was my job. It was my duty. I had to do it. That's why uh, I, was, I was doing it. Um, and it stagnated my faith um, and made me kind of just stand still. I'd forgotten the main thing that it was all about. My faith, if you like, it looked really pretty on the outside. I had lots of things that I was doing. I had different ministries I was part of. There were lots of people turning up to some events and things, and it all looked really good. If you looked at it from the outside, you might have said, this is someone who's got it together, um, whose faith is going quite well. But the reality was, it's a bit like a, an eggshell. It looks all firm on the outside, but on the inside it's crumbled. And if you were to hit it, it probably would break. So that's where I was uh, two years ago. We'll finish that story off later. Um, now, for these guys in Ephesus, I think that might be where they were at. They had dug in for the long haul. They knew all the things they'd been taught, and they sat down and got really good at them. Whether it was calling out false teachers, um, standing firm for the name of the Lord, they were great at that, as, as Jesus praised them for in the letter. It had all become about doing those things to survive, to face up to the persecution. This was the, thing, the things that they were used to doing by now. And it was quite easy for them to slip into these things and just do them, because they'd been going really well. They'd kind of got the blinders on. For those of you here that drive, um, you might find yourself able to um, understand this a little bit, um, where you found yourself on autopilot. Um, so if you have left the house um, with the intention of, oh, it's a lovely sunny day, got a day off, I'm going to go to the beach. It's your intention, you get everything ready. Um, and as you're about to leave, you kind of got everything going on in your mind. Have I got my sun cream? Have I got my good book to read? Some swimming stuff, a towel, a warm jumper for later? That's all going on, and you drive to the end of your drive, um, and you're starting to think about everything else that's going on. And... Before you know it, you've just pulled in at your place of work. No idea how, really how you got there. And you suddenly go, how have I done that? I was meant to be going to the beach, but now I'm here. What's gone wrong? Well, I've, I've been distracted before. I was thinking so much about all of the preparation that I had to do and all of the things I had to bring with me to go to the beach and how amazing the beach was going to be when I got there. 
that I'd fall into a, a habit that I'm so used to of driving to work. And that's where I'd ended up. I've been distracted from the importance of the journey. Because the journey in a Christian walk is really important. The journey is the bit we live here on earth. And sure, the end and the prize at the end is amazing. But the journey is where we get to live a life on earth in a relationship with God and experience the joy of that and share it with others. But we'd lost that. Church in, in Ephesus, I think, had lost a bit of that. They had lost their love of God. They were just doing the things without the love they had at the beginning. I mean, if you ever started a, a new relationship with somebody, but when you start a new relationship with somebody, you're kind of obsessive. You really want to get to know them. It's all about, the, it's all about them, uh, and it's really passionate, and you're kind of like, yes. Um, and that's what our relationship with Jesus is called to be like all the time. It's quite scary, because that's a lot of effort. But he's worth it. Now, when Jesus was asked, um, back in the, in the Gospels, you can read it in Mark's Gospel, um, he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he didn't say, go and do lots of coffee mornings. He didn't say, go and do lots of different ministries. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And second to this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Without the love for God, what else is there? Why couldn't somebody outside the church do everything else we do if we don't do it with the love of God? If we were to lose a generation of people from the church, it would not be because we didn't entertain them. It wouldn't be because we didn't run enough different courses, enough different ministries. It wouldn't even be because we didn't tell them the, go- because we didn't tell them the gospel. It would be because we didn't dare to live out the love of Jesus in the things we do and the relationships we have. And that's a terrifying statement. At least to me, anyway. It's a massive challenge to us and to the Christians of Ephesus. If you're doing all of this great work, it looks really cool, but if you're not doing it because you love God first, it's a bit of a front. It's got no depth. It's got no heart. What does our love of Jesus do in our lives? Does it just sit there? Do we truly know and love God? Do we let it overflow into all areas of our lives? Or do we pack it up and only let it out on a Sunday? Does our faith and love of God lead us to action? Does it lead us to want to serve in ministries of the church or to go and tell our colleagues at work um, who Jesus is or to witness to them in the way we live our life? Does it drive us to that because we love the Lord? Now, the book of James is a fantastic book. Firstly, it's quite short, so it's good for a a quick read. Um, But it's a book that, to summarise, really talks about that we are saved by faith alone. But if we don't do anything with our faith, if there is no action because of our faith, what, what is our faith? If your faith and your love of Jesus and your love for his people doesn't drive you to do something, what is it? I feel it's really important as well to say that we're human, right? We're going to get it wrong, and we're going to fail to love people a lot of the time. For me, particularly when I'm driving. (laughs) And that's okay. God recognizes that. He has grace and mercy for each of us to go and do it again, to get back up. So, the question we need to ask ourselves tonight is what is at the center of my faith? Is it the things I do or my love for Jesus and his people? And it's a really difficult question. Um, It's one that, to bring back to my earlier story, that I asked myself over two years ago, properly for the first time, 
really. Um, and it led me to quit my job um, and to go away to YWAM and spend some time with God um, to get my love for him back because I'd lost it. I didn't check up on myself regularly. I didn't ask myself this question honestly at any real point in my 25 years of life previously to that. And it was an incredible experience going away and spending that time with God. I understand I was really fortunate to be able to go and take that time out and do that. And for each of us, that's not necessarily an option. But to genuinely ask ourselves that question, what is at the center of my faith? Why am I doing the things I'm doing? That's really important. And that retreat that was being spoken about earlier, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity for anybody here who wants to ask themselves that question and gets to an answer that they don't like, that it's not all about Jesus in your life, it's not about your love. That sounds like a great thing to go on to discover that again. Make loving Jesus the main thing we do. Because without it, all of the ministry and everything else has little point. If we start out of love for Jesus, out of love for others, that goes into ministry. And then that ministry meets other people. And from that ministry comes more people that will love God because you love them first in that ministry. It creates a nice little cycle. Love first, make that the main thing in your faith and your walk with Jesus. Love Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you will get a love for his people and you will have a drive to do something with that. Whether it's joining a ministry in the church, whether it's talking to somebody you know at work and asking them for a coffee and showing them love that way. So ask yourself this question. What's at the center of my faith? Is it the things I do? Or is it my love for Jesus and for his people?